Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You may know by now that we study the Sabbath School lesson as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is focused on the book of James. It's a small book, and we've been studying it for several weeks now. In fact, we're ready for lesson number 11, and this lesson is the one that we'll be studying together on December 13 of 2014. I hope you'll find this lesson, as you found others, I hope, very interesting and challenging and provocative. We'll ask you to grab your Bibles, because we'll be looking at a lot of different places in the Bible, not just in the book of James. And before, you, before we get started here, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we ask the Lord to guide. Our loving Father, we recognize your presence with us at all times. And now we ask your special guidance, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, as we open your word to seek to understand it better. Forgive our sins and help us to walk closer to you every day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson is going to focus on a section of James, James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. And it's a, question, it's a, a section which will talk about how do we get ready for Jesus to come back again. And you wonder, it talks about people who are waiting for the harvest. And I'm, I'm reminded of several things. Uh, one of the things I'm reminded of is, there's a parable in Matthew 25 that talks about people who are sleeping just before Jesus comes again. Are we supposed to be getting ready or are we supposed to be sleeping? Well. In James 5, verses 7 and 8, let's read those verses first. Be patient then, my brothers and sisters, until the Lord comes. Now, if you, if you get too patient, do you fall asleep? Too patient? See how patient a farmer is as he waits for his land to produce precious crops. He waits patiently for the autumn and spring rains. You also must be patient. Keep your hopes high, for the day of the Lord's coming is near. Now... James thought it was near, and that was t almost 2,000 years ago. Mm. Was he wrong? Um, That's on your definition of near. Definition of near. It's interesting when it talks about coming here. <coughs> There's a very interesting Greek word, parousia. Anybody know what parousia means? It has two distinct meanings. One actually means to arrive, to come, but the other meaning is to be present. So you could see how coming would, would naturally lead to being present. And it was often a word used in connection with the arrival of dignitaries. Some important person comes and you get the place ready, you clean up the town, you paint the walls, whatever, you know, and here, the big day, the person arrives. That's a parousia. Um, does that word parousia indicate getting ready also? Well, if you think someone's coming, important coming, then you ought to be getting ready. That's the idea, yeah. Um, and what about this idea that farmers sort of plant and then they wait and then they harvest? Is that a true picture? A farmer is busy every single day between planting and harvesting. There is not Maybe. any time to rest except for when it gets dark and when the rooster wakes him up in the morning. I see. I think uh, to a large extent it is. Most farmers, it doesn't matter whether you're an orchardist or growing grain or running cows, but certainly those that have to plow the ground, it depends on the kind of ground you've got as to how much rain you need and when. Mm -hmm. They get very involved in that. Mm -hmm. In We're, Palestine, well, go ahead. In California, we've solved that with irrigation. Mm -hmm. Somewhat. <laughs> more yeah, look, at, look at the Central Valley, which produces yes, this too, huge, yeah, huge amounts of food for the world. Well, in Palestine, which was a very marginal rainfall area in 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 known historical times, it may have been much better earlier. We don't know. Uh, it was called a land of milk and honey, which means probably at that point in time it had, had enough rain. But in Palestine, normally the early rains are in October, November, and the so-called latter rains are in March or April. So that 
gives us a little feel. And, and there, the Bible talks quite a lot about early rains and latter rains. Places like Deuteronomy 11, well, besides our place here in James 5, Deuteronomy 11, Jeremiah 5 and 14, Joel 2, and some interesting comparisons in Hosea 6 and Joel 2 and Habakkuk 3. Habakkuk 3 is a very interesting passage I would like us to look at for just a second. This is at the very end of the book of Habakkuk. And do you remember, who could tell me what the book of Habakkuk is about? That's one that we all just use all the time. It's right on the tip of our tongues, right? <laughs> Habakkuk is a book, a conversation between a prophet and God. And the prophet says to God, hey, why are you letting the Babylonians come over here and conquer us? And God says, well, if I told you, you know, he says, why are you, actually what he says is, why are you letting all these evil things happen? And God says, you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till the Babylonians come. And so Habakkuk says, well, what are we supposed to do? And God says, trust me. And here are those final words I'd like to read to you. Even though the fig trees, now remember, Habakkuk is a subsistence farmer. What do we mean by a subsistence farmer? What he grows, he eats. Hand to mouth. <laughs> what, hand to mouth. What he gets, what he can grow at a given time, that's what he has to eat, okay? Even though the fig trees have no fruit, and no grapes grow on the vines, the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no corn, that would be wheat, and this is corn in a British translation, even though the sheep all die, and the cattle stalls, stalls are empty, I will still be joyful and glad. Why? Because the Lord God is my Savior. The yeah. Sovereign Lord gives me strength, He makes me sure-footed as a deer, and keeps me safe on the mountains. What do you have left if you're a subsistence farmer and all that's happened? God. Looks like faith. Mm. Yeah? Is that good to eat? <laughs> well, <coughs> faith is believing that it will come out in the end, don't you think? Now, many of you who grew up as Adventists remember bedtime stories, Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories. And what happened in Uncle Arthur's bedtime stories? When the cupboard was bare, what happened? Food came from an unexpected source. The family would kneel down and pray, and suddenly there would be a knock on the door, and there would be somebody with a basket of food, right? Well, not quite that extreme. What do you mean, not That's quite that? how the stories were. Yep. <coughs> well, you know, in the Bible there, it says, God keeps me safe on the mountain. It sounds like God is providing on the mountain. Maybe there's wild herbs or something. He, do, he doesn't say, praise the Lord and I'm starving. He mm -hmm. says, God keeps me safe on the mountain. And, and I always so. think Adventists will be safe on the mountain because they're the only group of people that can chomp on nature. <laughs> <laughs> on a pine tree or on a whatever. Well, Ellen White comments with these words, and this is from, um, Acts the Apostles, pages 50, the end of, bottom of 54 and top of 55. Under the figure of the early and the latter rain that falls in eastern lands at seed time and harvest, the Hebrew prophets foretold the bestowal of spiritual grace in extraordinary measure upon God's church. The outpouring of the Spirit in the days of the Apostles was the beginning of the early or former rain, and glorious was the result. But near the close of earth's harvest, a special bestowal of spiritual grace. What is it? A special bestowal of spiritual grace is promised to prepare the church for the coming of the Son of Man. This outpouring of the Spirit, and what do we call that? Latter rain. The latter rain. This outpouring of the Spirit is likened to the falling of the latter rain. It is for this added power that Christians are to send their petitions to the Lord of the harvest in the time of the latter rain. So then if we don't feel that we're prepared right now to encounter the latter days, that would be understandable. Matter of fact, we, evidently we, we shouldn't be because the latter rain is coming to prepare us. Well, I don't think that's the... <laughs> the correct story. The Holy Spirit works in, in 
this is a little bit of a side, but let's just review this very quickly. The Holy Spirit works in, at four levels in our lives, in the lives of everybody. The lowest level is, and this would be the power of God, He keeps us alive, makes our all the physiology work, etc. God sustains our lives at the lowest level. The next level, and, and the Bible talks about this, Ellen White talks about this, He woos us. That is, the Holy Spirit is constantly trying to encourage people to move closer and closer to God, to study our Bibles, to pray, to, to recognize that God is caring for us. The third level, he actually, when people start to respond to that wooing, he blesses them and leads to baptism and conversion. That's the third step. And then the fourth level, which people talk about a lot, is when he gives spiritual gifts to people so that they can go out and witness. Not, not spiritual gifts so they can sit at home, but spiritual gifts so they can go out and use those spiritual gifts to reach others. So we're talking about, you're asking the question, do we sort of ignore these first three things and then hope that someday God is going to give us number four? No, we need to be working through these other steps. We need to be doing our homework. We need to be getting ourselves ready so that when God does give us the Holy Spirit in latter rain power, we're ready to do something. What so, happens when you're, how do you, how do you get ready? How do you know that you're ready? Well, it's not I mean, a question of knowing that you're ready. It's saying God... We have to get ready. That means we have, it's, we have to work towards something. What is it? Well, it's Bible study, prayer, witnessing. And that's going to do it? Train, yes, it will. Train in your brain. Yeah. The, um, I'm going to a group, a different faith group, Baptist, and it's being taught by a American history uh, high school teacher, and he was an honors teacher, and he's doing his master's in religious history. He says, if you look at an American history, religious revivals have been every so often, and he's studying it. He, he talks so excited. He says, we're due for another one. Mm -hmm. It's coming. We're due. And that is, he's, do, he's doing a study on exactly how many years they were set apart. And they are sure that there's going to be another big religious revival. And I keep thinking of that latter rain. So other groups are expecting something too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's due in history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one true. Sorry. Good. One thing I noted in uh, said the one the Habakkuk. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's like they have a, t a tendency of praying rhythmically in music, mm. and uh, a few religions, even the Jews, tend to do that, <laughs> and they believe in doing that too with with sort of music to God a repetition. I read. I saw a lot of that in that. I'm thinking <laughs> that might not be a bad thing to do. <laughs> Well, I can tell you one thing about doing it with music. Yeah. Um, when my children were growing up, we managed to buy, we got some small books that had a whole collection of scripture songs. Mm -hmm. yeah. And every week we would learn a new scripture song. And, you know, if, you, if, if I'm reading through the Bible, I'll say, oh, and, I, and you know that song. And, and you don't have to memorize it. We, you, know, you learn the tune and you remember the words. Mm -hmm. We're still, still though, we're, we're using these figures to prepare. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out exactly what are we preparing. What, is, what happens when we're prepared? Are we just good people then after that? And that God likes us now because we're good people? Is I that? think God is waiting. Well, we know that Ellen White says God is waiting with longing desire. For, and this is Christ Opera Lessons, page 68 and 69, if I'm not mistaken. God is waiting for a longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his people. So, he, he, And when that happens, God will say, I'm ready. And, and well, I'm, this so is, God is, I don't good. want you to. God is good, so mm -hmm. he's waiting for us to be good, too? Yes. Well. So is that... <laughs> um, how is this that? is what, and, and I mean, I'm going to how? say this very briefly. Yeah. I, I, we don't have time to go a whole, spend an hour on this, but it would be my understanding as I read Scripture that God is waiting for us. It doesn't need to be a huge group of people, a, a group of people who will stand firm no matter what the devil does to them. They cannot be shaken. We're going to read about that in a little bit later. Job. They can't, like Job. And when, cause, because God needs to have a time when he can turn to the devil and say, okay, Satan, 
I have my people, and here they are, and there's nothing you can do to them that'll make them stumble or fall. And these people will be the final witnesses. They will be taken to court. They'll be put in prison. Some of them might be, at least they will try to kill them and so forth like this. And God will be by their side, and they will be the witness, the, the final witnesses to the world. And you mean out of all the people on the world, there isn't a handful of people like that? I think, I mean, the, the, question, the question is, how many does it take? I don't know. It, it, God will decide that. But he needs, he needs some people. I mean, imagine God uh, say, oh, well, I guess we're ready for the end. And then everybody in the Adventist church just falls apart. We're supposed to be the ones who are giving the final message to the world. What would happen if we all fell apart? People the have. church, we, we know, let's just think about this for a moment. When Sabbath be keeping becomes illegal, the Adventist church as an organization cannot possibly exist. What happens then? We're on our own, and if we don't put the spade work in to our minds when we put on the hot seat down the line, I don't think we can expect God to remind us what to say. I disagree with that statement because the church is not just getting up and going in a building. Mm -hmm. Even if, you know, the well, Sunday law comes, we're still a church. If we in our heart, yeah. wherever we may be, we are who we are. We don't stop yeah. being Adventist just because we cannot no, go no. in a building on Saturday. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. But what I'm saying is all those artificial things that we have, all the buildings that are called Seventh-day Adventists, the organization will cease to exist. We will now be on our own. Yeah. And as, as Seventh-day Adventists, as a people, will continue to exist. But as an organization, as an official, recognized, government-recognized organi government organization, we will cease to exist. Well, the preparation has to start before that time. Yes. Yes. We should start now, of course. The also. visible concrete support that we take for granted will go. Yeah. So, and, so we're, we're going to be able to become a better punching bag and not... And not well, um, well, run out on God? Is that, that what it is? Partly. 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 Well, what's well, the other part? Well, we, <laughs> well okay. We, we, the, what, we have been what has been described in the Bible is we're going to be like Job's. We're going to be like Jacob's, time of Jacob's trouble. And we're going to be like Noah's. Think about what happened to them. We won't be able to witness or have a spine strong enough to survive it. So, yeah. so we are going to be punching bags. Yes. So, of the three, I would and take. That's, that's, that's what God's waiting for, is, is he's hard waiting, punching bags? He's waiting for you and me to say, even if I'm ready, if I'm, if I'm got my head chopped off, I will still be saying, God, I trust you, I'm on your side, I will not. And, and not only will the devil not be able to persecute me into submission, he won't be able to deceive me into sub submission, and that's probably a bigger threat. I agree with that one. So, so does that does He's that waiting for us to be us? able to take the punches and withstand the punches. Yeah, uh, yeah but how does that come, though? Uh, do we just grit our teeth and, Peter, and become Peter strong? Said, Peter said, be ready at any moment to give a reason to anyone who asks you for the reasons for your faith. Well, I keep thinking about Stephen, though. When mm -hmm. he got stoned, mm -hmm. he, went into, he went into a vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's not gritting your but, teeth. He, he's well, actually getting the spirit in him, and then for some reason he can he can take the stones and exactly. say the right things. I, and I agree with that. But what he had to say, I don't think came by vision. That came from his good study. Right. Because if you read what, what went into that, he had been going to he had been going to synagogues with all the Jews and giving arguments for Christianity that they could not refute. And that's why he was there getting stoned. Because he'd already given arguments that nobody could refute. And, and, he's and are we doing do that? that? Because he's... he's because he, his, he did his, his homework. Studying and he, did and his homework. he did his homework. He did his homework. He's led by the Spirit. It was a process of teaching, and, and mm. teaching the truth about God. But we need to move on with our lesson. We don't want to spend the whole time on the first passage. Um, James 5, verse 8, we already read it, suggests that Christ's coming is near or perhaps even at hand. 2,000 years later, we're still waiting. How could that be near? And we asked that question a moment ago. Before, a moment ago. I'm, going to, I'm going to respond with a passage written in 1883 by Ellen White. Manuscript 4, 1883, it's recorded in Evangelism, page 695, paragraph 1. 
the angels of God in their messages to men represent time as very short. And you can go back all the way back to, to Joel in the Old Testament. And it sounds like it's going to happen right now. Thus it was, has always been presented to me, Ellen White says. It is true that time has continued longer than we expected in the early days of this message. Our Savior did not appear as soon as we hoped. But has the word of the Lord failed? Never. It should be remembered that the promises and the threatenings of God are alike conditional. What does that mean? Uh, if in, then... In, in if one what, sense, the what? coming of the Lord could be at hand. None of us know when we're going to go. Or yeah. illustration the, of what we're seeing in the, the news now. Uh, you might say, and it sounds rather macabre, but some are fortunate to get shot. Some are not. They go through a lot worse than that. Mm -hmm. And you might be needed to, you might want to say the piece, but it can be quick, it can be, it'll take a long I mean, time, I mean, jail, stop, whatever. Stop and think about this. If there is a group of people, as I suggest, who are standing strong and firm for God through the final days of this earth's history, what do you think the devil's going to want to do to them? He's going to ramp it up. Just, just think about it for a moment. And God is going to let them do, he's going to let the devil do up to the point where we can stand it, whatever that means. I mean, he says, I will not allow you to be tempted more than you're able. So that means maybe I don't have to be quite as strong as I'm making out. You want to risk it? <laughs> Why are you laughing, Jim? <laughs> That's like this. Yeah, well, you are to be perfect. <laughs> well, do I have to be perfect? No, it's an offer. So, so I, mean, well, I just I got the lung cancer. I just want to be part part of it gone away. I, I'll die from the rest of it. I mean, it's it's well, kind of ludicrous. Well, I'm scared if I if I do my big dumbbells every day, you know, my my weights. That at the end, I'm just going to have a bigger weight to have to deal with. Oh, well, <laughs> that's that. You know, you, you, you're saying you're there saying is something to that. <laughs> well, the more the more talent you are given, and day by day, as you grow in your as you grow in your relationship with God, you you become stronger, right. and you just it, it gets stronger and stronger. You know what? You get tested more strongly. That's, what you're but it's fun. <laughs> Oh, it's fine. <laughs> okay. What you're, what you're saying happens every day and has happened throughout history mm -hmm. as people face disease and as they face horrors of what has happened to their family and, and don't get bitter towards God and, and keep the uh, sin problem in mind. They are doing exactly what you're saying individually. I mean, there have been many, many jobs on this world, and if you're faced with a life-threatening disease, you, you know, you may have the job experience. So it's not anything that hasn't happened. It's mm -hmm. just that you're saying it has to happen corporately with yeah. a lot of people together. Yeah, it has happened individually through World War One, yeah. Two, yeah. Vietnam. I mean. You know, yeah. Isn't, so, isn't Bible study kind of like a vaccination for the mind? You know, you vaccine, you vaccinate somebody, to you you test them, you test their immune system. But if they de develop enough antibodies, then they are stronger. They could maybe this applies to the Ebola or whatever. I don't know if it if it knocks you down, it makes you more susceptible. Uh, but anyway, using the, the analogy, which has its limitations, yeah. that might be a, a, yeah. a parallel. Matthew is the only gospel writer who talks about the kingdom of heaven. What's the kingdom of heaven? It begins now. Jesus. Well, many people don't realize it, but if you go back and look at the passages carefully, there are two parts to the kingdom of heaven. There's the God works with us right now, and there's the future kingdom in heaven. And sometimes people get, you know, bent out of shape because they think, the, this is supposed to mean Jesus comes right now. No, the, we're supposed to be living godlike lives and experiencing the heavenly experience right now here on this earth. And that's supposed to prepare us for the time when Jesus will come. Even if there was no pie in the sky by and by, mm -hmm. but if some were just putting it off until, well, I'll get the in the by and by. No, it's, if, we have to, if you're not living it right now, 
and are not willing to be educated, what do you want to go to heaven for? Yeah. When at the conversion experience, doesn't basically eternal life begin then? Yeah. It and can. so therefore, in a way, it could be argued that heaven begins at that time. Yeah, exactly. Well, what do you do it, with it may not be, it may not feel like heaven, but yes, that's true. What let, do you do let, with John three, seventeen, and so yeah, forth? Talking about the judgment. Yeah. Well, uh, for God so loved the world, and so forth. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved or healed through Him. He who believes. In him is not condemned. He does not believe is not condemned already, and so forth. But uh, the not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah. It's, it's uh, well, you know, when you haven't been a Christian, I think you have more of a comparison. You become a Christian. The kingdom of God is now because once you become a Christian, God helps you live a better life, and you can definitely look back at your old life and say, "Yes, I am participating in the kingdom of heaven," because look from where I came. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what's our citizenship supposed to be? What, is, what does heaven. it say? Our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians we're just passing through. Yeah. The guy says, we're living in occupied territory well, behind enemy lines. Conduct yourself accordingly. Let me read a couple of passages. Sure. First of all, Second Peter 3, 10 to 12. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed. And the earth with everything in it will vanish. Now that sounds like it's a pretty disruptive kind of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God, Gary. As you wait for the day of God, do your best to make it come soon. Mm. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. And then if you jump over to Ellen White, she says, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. And that's, uh, well, the easiest place to find it probably is SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1161, paragraph 6. Is the shaking the church shaking, or is the shaking the end of the world uh, time of trouble. Yes. When she says, okay, that's the shaking. Both. And that all Both? Takes, and that okay. takes place in our mind. Mm -hmm. And if it's a law of human nature, you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. You got to train your brain. We are supposed to be, well, go ahead, Jay. Why is it, why is it so important that this, that the, that this coming comes soon? Why is it, why, well, why, I mean, why, why do we want it to come why, so soon? The longer, are, are you worried that it's been 2,000 years later? Are you worried it's been too soon? We need well, to prolong it. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I just why 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 does it? Have I to would be like soon? to be alive to see Jesus come in the clouds. Ah, I see. Well, that's kind of a selfish reason. I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't have any selfishness left. Just that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but let's look. Let's look at some passages. Let's be realistic. The Adventist Church went through a, well, not the Adventist church as we know, but Adventists as a group went through the Great Disappointment in 1844. That is now more than 170 years. The Bible talks about a delay. How long do you think God should wait? Didn't he, how many years did he wait for Noah? 220? 120. Oh, we're already past that. Oh, oh yeah. Dear. 50 years past that. How long did he wait for Israel? 40 years yeah. wandering in the wilderness. Yeah. We're wow. way past that. And, they, and they, those that went in weren't those that left, left Egypt. We're not you think, doing so good. Did God intend for the children of Israel to wander in the wilderness for 40 years? No. Clearly he did not. Did he intend for us to be here 770 years later? No. And I quote, We have far more to fear from within than from without. The unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encouraged the presence of evil angels, and opened the way for the accomplishment of, the, of Satan's devices. Review and Herald, March 22, 1887. So, James talks about grumbling and complaining. Now, nobody in the Adventist church would grumble or complain, would they? Never. Not unless you're on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
And what does the internet do, do you suppose? Make us anonymous? And but, make things come quickly. And, 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 and what do people do when they're grumbling and complaining about the church? What's the result? That's a good excuse for withholding our tithe, for narrowing our vision, you know. Be in my group, we're the good guys and everybody else is bad guys. And well, it some, keeps, some people have stopped going to church. It keeps your vision off what God wants you to do. Mm -hmm. You're focused on grumbling and mm -hmm. you're not focused on what God has right at your left hand or your right hand. There is no productive grumbling when the... We grumble about uh, the fact that, uh, I don't know, well, women are not being treated equally in the church. That's not a productive grumbling. You, are you doing something about it, you, or are you just grumbling? You, you, I, don't, I, can think of, I can't think of any other good grumblings right now, but I'm sure <laughs> there are some. How about the Lord so coming again? Can you grumble about that? I'm sorry? Yeah, how about the Lord coming again? Can you grumble about that, that He hasn't come? Well, next paragraph, Ken. <laughs> okay, the next paragraph says, what, what, what do you think were the problems? James says the problems in his church, using his, uh, we're using our modern words, not his words, were favoritism, evil surmising, evil speaking towards one another, envy, quarrels, especially worldliness. Okay, you want to start with that list? What are the major problems in the Adventist church today? Of course, we don't have any, right? All of what you said. Those are pretty small. That's I pretty small stuff. Why can't we have, when they're murdering and incest and, I mean, that sounds like pretty small <laughs> potatoes there compared to. We're having a real what, crisis. What are we holding things up? Yes. <clears throat> We're having a real crisis because the world is changing, tradition is changing, mm -hmm. and the Adventist church is built on certain beliefs. And we're having a riptide of the two. Mm -hmm. And it's just tearing things apart. Mm -hmm. Just like in 1888. Yeah. Well, or what, 1844 before that. What were the problems in <clears throat> God's church around the time that Jesus came? They were health reforming, tithe paying, Sabbath keeping, doing everything according to the book. But Seventh what did Adventist. they do? They were sev Seventh day Adventists, yeah. But <laughs> When God came Himself, they killed Him. Mm -hmm. Yep. We wouldn't do that, would we? We may know some that will. Maybe it's time for another prayer. Huh? Well, James says the solution, at least he suggests some possible solutions. Faith, the implanted word. What's an implanted word? Have an we're talking about what you go through and memorize and learn. You, you, you plant those ideas in your head because someday when you're standing before a judge, you're going to need those ideas. Okay? The implanted word, beholding the law of liberty. Remember, he talks about the law of liberty. Single mindedness and godly wisdom. That means I'm not going to let myself be distracted by what's happening, I don't know, in the theater or in Wall Street or in the government circles, Focus. grace, clean hands and a pure heart, what does that imply? Outward expression of God's inward workings, visiting the afflicted and forgotten and sowing peace rather than discord. Well, there's some suggestions. What do you think of James' suggestions? Applicable today. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, look at verses 10 and 11. James 5, 10 and 11. My brothers and sisters, I'm reading a gender-inclusive version. My brothers and sisters, remember the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, what prophets would he be speaking about? Old Testament prophets. Old Testament prophets. Were there prophets in the New Testament? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. There, there's several of them mentioned specifically. Paul is considered a prophet in the New Testament if you read the book of Acts. Take them, the Old Testament prophets, take them as examples of patient endurance under suffering. Is that going to happen again? We call them happy because they endured. Do we think we're going to be happy as we endure? You have heard of Job's patience, and you know the Lord provided for him in the end. For the Lord is full of mercy and compassion. 
You will be happier if you endure. I'm not sure enduring is going to make you happy. So here's a question. We've looked at the book of Job several times. What was, the, what was Job's biggest problem? Couldn't get he, an answer back from God. He obviously lost his family. He lost all his wealth. He you know, lost his health. He lost everything, virtually everything that people normally would say, that's important to me. And then... His religious friends attacked his him close friends, yeah. verbally. His, his great friends attacked him saying, obviously you did something really wrong, Job, fess up, right? And where did all those accusations and so forth coming from, come from? Well, we know, about, we know about Job 1 and 2, where God and, and Satan are discussing this in heaven. But look at Job 4. Many people don't recognize this. Job 4, starting with verse 13. Look at the accusations that happened here. Like, this is one of Job's friends trying to say, where he got his ideas. Like a nightmare disturbed my sleep. I trembled and shuddered. My whole body shook with fear. A light breeze touched my face. What's another name for light breeze? Spirit. And my hair bristled with fright. I could see something standing there. I stared but couldn't tell what it was. Then I heard a voice out of the silence. Can anybody be righteous in the sight of God or be pure before his creator? God does not trust his heavenly servants. He finds fault even with his angels. Guess who's talking? Do you think he will distrust a creature of clay, a thing of dust that can be crushed like a moth? Add to that Job 15, 15 and yeah. 16. This, he, this guy Eliphaz is just a mouthpiece for the devil. It says basically the same thing, but yeah. it's twice, twice in the book of Job. Yeah, exactly. And they use, and they use the, the quarterly or the Bible study guide has used that for a Bible memory verse. Yeah. So, yeah, no serious. When we studied the book of Job, what the meaning was. This these words from Satan were the memory verse. <laughs> Where was this? In the 7th day Adventist Sabbath, Sabbath school Sabbath lesson. school quarterly? It was in the Sabbath school quarterly. What year was that? Who wrote that? that? Who wrote that lesson? Perfect. I think it's time to move. <laughs> it's time to move on. <laughs> that got by the general conference? No, it came through. Sabbath school sure. committee? It did. <laughs> Think about the examples of Daniel being thrown into the den of lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. Elijah and Elisha, were, whose lives were threatened, re threatened repeatedly. Look at 2 Kings 1, for example. Jeremiah in chapter 33. Hanani in 2 Chronicles 16 were put in prison. And Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, was stoned in the temple courtyard. And Isaiah was sawn in half. Are we facing any of those kind of problems today? Some people are. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we're the ones who are supposed to be getting ready for the second coming. When are we going to face this kind of stuff? Well, do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> I think it could. Why be don't you just get it going there. and you can run out and, yeah. and well, how do we <laughs> find a saw and give it to somebody and say, chase after you me. You know, a, a, <laughs> a mother, when her child is threatened, yeah. would go through any of that mm -hmm. to save her child. Mm -hmm. The love is so strong. Our love for God should be so strong that we will go through that to preserve God's character. Is, I mean, it's, it's the same thing. It's developed in us today. Is the reason we're not having those... Remember, it, um, second, second Timothy 3, verse... 20 or somewhere around in there. I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be quoting things just from memory here. But it says, all who, are, who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Well, that explains a lot. It does. It explains why I have such a hard time <laughs> oh, okay. in my classes. And if the world... Persecuted by my students. If the world doesn't <laughs> like you... The world didn't like me either. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, Jesus came and healed and fed people, and they nailed him to a cross. Yeah. So I mean, look at all the people he he he, he you know raised. From, I mean, some he raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. You know, and they still crucified him. That was Second Peter three twelve. Yeah. Thank you. Second Peter three twelve. I'm just giving first, first sorry, Second Timothy. You said yeah. You said that right. Okay. Right. Second the, the Timothy. Verse twelve. Okay, verse 12. Well, but you know, there are some passages and there are some counsel from Ellen White not to go around 
<coughs> doing things, which is going to cause persecution to come on prematurely. And what's the story about that guy that would <coughs> going off setting off dynamite on this on Sundays because he was a Sabbath geek and had wanted to do his mining and and got everybody all riled up. Okay, but but what if we just <laughs> what, what, what what if we just witnessed better? What would happen then? <coughs> well, what more, kind more. of persecution are you expecting? I, I'm, I'm asking, what would happen if even a relatively small group of Adventists said, I'm going to go out every Sunday and witness? Go out every Sunday and witness to what? <laughs> no, listen. Uh, no, <laughs> that's a good question. A good, uh, no, I mean, I'm talking about the subject. Are you going to go out there and bang him over the head that they're keeping Sunday? Is that what you're going to no, do? No, I'm, I'm going to drop. Well, what, what, are you, what are you going to do on Sunday? I'm that's going there, I'm going to I'm going to go out there and say to people, "Do you know what the Bible says?" And they're going to say, "The Bible? What's that?" I bought Doug Batchelor's book, Bible Answers, a mm -hmm. bunch of them. He had them on sale. Uh, and then every Sunday when I go to the post office, I leave one and I go to the grocery store and I go back and it's gone, so I leave another one. Mm -hmm. And so you can do things on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I'm talking about persecution here. I think you kind of are sneaking in no, there you and don't, getting you out don't, again. <laughs> but no, but you, you don't ask for persecution. You go out and do things that Disturb well, the devil. You just asked us. No, I, are we? Are we? Shouldn't we be been being persecuted? Shouldn't I'm, we be doing enough well, to get you persecuted? Did, you didn't listen. You didn't hear what I said in the verse. The verse says, "All who live." What do I do? All who live godly lives in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It doesn't mean I'm asking said, for persecution. And then you inferred that if we're not being persecuted, that means we're not living a godly life. That's, that's what, what I'm, that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay, so then you just told me not to go and try to, try I, to get going. I, I'm not saying going out and mining and setting <laughs> off dynamite <laughs> is what is the way you witness. What it, the Bible says it very clearly. There's three things that we're supposed to do: Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. Are we doing those things regularly, uh, uh, sufficiently so that someone thinks we need to be persecuted? Well, let's, let's simple question. You know, I am doing that stuff. Okay, I am doing it, but well, it's not. Now, it's not. You're in the city of Loma Linda. No one's going to persecute you in Loma Linda. Well, he just said if you did all that, you're going to get persecuted. Let's Step read on to verse 13, Linda. verse okay. 13 of, of <laughs> Tim, go 2 Timothy uh, 3, verse 13. While evil men and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceivers and deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct yep. you for salvation through faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's all. I mean, that's all well, you we, know, we're expected people, to do. People, you're not being persecuted 24/7. If you go out, a lot of people will absolutely love it, like mm -hmm. talking to you. It's you're going to find one here and there that's going to persecute you, and that's persecution. It's not a 24/7 everybody you meet, but there are people who will be offended, and that is part of persecution. Mm -hmm. It's not but, 24/7. No, but I, I find That's most good. of the most of the people are delighted and will talk, but some of them, uh, like uh, this teacher that I mentioned, I thought the world was created in uh, seven literal days. She wouldn't talk to me for weeks because she, <laughs> and she was just beside herself that I I would actually say that. Huh? And yeah, yeah, and she and she's talking to me now, but she was really mad. You know, and so, I I have actually s known some people that feel like they're doing the right thing when they get persecuted. So it's the persecution that's actually their litmus test to know whether they're doing something good or not. Well, I don't think that's probably we ought to go to that level. Uh, well, you know, we got to watch out for these things. We're going overboard. We got we got more in the lesson here. We yes. Need to hit Ken. <laughs> okay. Let me read another quotation from Ellen White. Do, are we Adventists really correctly representing God? And I quote, everything that Christians do should be as transparent as the sunlight. Truth is of God. Deception in every one of its myriad forms is of Satan. 
Are we in any way misrepresenting God by our daily lives? Wasn't it David who says, Lord, I've sinned against you mm -hmm. when he sinned? So when we're sinning, we're sinning against God. Well, are we growing up into the truth? Look at a couple of verses, Ephesians 4, verse 15. Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way to Christ who is the head. And dropping down to verse 29, do not use harmful words, but only helpful words, the kind that build up and provide what is needed so that what you say will do good to those who hear you. Do we live like that? Look at Colossians 4, 6 to compare it. Your speech should always be pleasant and interesting, and you should know how to give the right answer to everyone. Are we doing that? How many people around Loma Linda even, non-Adventist people around Loma Linda, know what Adventists believe? Very few. How about Tacoma Park? Let's pick on them a while. <laughs> <laughs> Berrien Springs. Well, here, here's some words about, talking about Elijah is one of our examples. In, in discussing about Elijah, Ellen White says, and for those who want to look at this, this is Pe Prophets and Kings, page 174, going on to 175 and following. To wait patiently, to trust when everything looks dark, is a lesson that the leaders in God's work need to learn. Heaven will not fail, fail them in their day of adversity. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on God. Trials will come. Well, you know, when I walk into the Baptist group, um, I always pray to God, witness to yourself through me. Mm -hmm. Me of myself, is, I'm a bumbling idiot. Mm -hmm. And you will have a bumbling idiot as a witness if you don't witness through me. And so we can't do it. Mm -hmm. And God has to um, infuse it in yeah. us. Trials will come, but go forward. This will strengthen your faith and fit you for service. The records of sacred history are written not merely that we may read and wonder, but that the same faith which wrought in God's service of old may work in us. We're supposed to learn from those examples. And I read on a little bit later in the couple, about two pages later, she said, and think about this in terms of the world around us. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes, an incorrect picture of God, and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. Is that written to any particular group Ra in mind? <clears throat> What's the date on that? Do you know? That's Prophets of Kings, 117. It was printed in 2015, right after Ellen White died. 1915. 1915. Did I say 15? 1915. Yeah. <clears throat> Anybody, if, if we in this room have a cherish a false concept of God, we have a graven image, we have an idol. Yeah. Well, some people don't know they're worshiping, and they're worshiping with all their might to yeah. who they think is God. And our conception of God may not be that great either when we actually live for a while. How would we go about finding out whether our conception of God is correct? Well, I, I'm just saying that it's probably something that goes forward as time goes forward. I mean... We should grow. We just we read grow. that. We grow. Yeah. Should, we just read that. But, um, how but I mean, do where, where how, do we, how high we've grown so far? Where do we learn about God? The Bible, and for Adventists, I would say the writings of Ellen White. There's God's hundreds and hundreds of pages of God's putting himself out in print, you know, through his no. prophets and saying, learn well, about me. I, I'm just talking about the level of growth that we are mm -hmm. right now. How do, you, how do you know how high we really are? I don't think any, any, any point is high enough. I think it's every day we need to be trying to make it go higher. It's amazing how many people do not actually read the Bible. They'll I, listen to a preacher who's talking about his opinion, and there will never be a Bible verse quoted. No one will ever look at the Bible, and then they'll go home, mm -hmm. and they are listening to that man, and they are not checking. I will, I will tell you about an experience I had um, with a friend, we were traveling in a city far away from here. 
we decided to visit a church, a large, very famous church. If I mentioned the name of it, probably everyone here would know what church I'm talking about. Um, on a Sunday morning, went into church, and the preacher preached a whole sermon on, quote, Colossians 2020. There isn't such a verse. <laughs> it was actually after close to that, and no yeah. one said it. No one thought to look. And, and and the whole sermon was based on Second Chronicles twenty twenty. But his audience basically didn't believe in the Old Testament, so he said, "Just call it Colossians twenty twenty. No one will be looking up in their Bible. No one will be asking any questions." We wrote him a nice letter saying we found this very interesting when we visited your church. We got a form letter back from him says. We're so glad that you visited our church. We hope you'll see us again the next time you're in <laughs> blank city. You mean you sent him a letter? You didn't send him a letter. You didn't stand up in church and correct him? Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. Brings on persecution. <laughs> persecution. <laughs> That's a good way to get it started. <laughs> what church was this? How come you won't speak up I, here? See, every... <laughs> Not an Adventist church. All right, let me ask you. <laughs> if you if Sunday you, morning to If me you off. watch... If you watch TV, the variety of preachers, that is going on today. Mm -hmm. Well, the New Testament goes on and on and on about what we need to do to get ready. A simple example is Matthew 24, 14, which I'm sure everyone in this room has memorized. And I read it once again, and this God, good news, I'm using the Good News Bible, and this good news about the kingdom will, will be preached through all the world for a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And I recently spent three weeks in a Muslim country as a visitor. And they reminded me that they didn't remind me something. I read a book that was written on this subject before I got there that the Quran says if you're a Christian living in a Muslim country, you are a second class citizen by definition. Your taxes are higher. You're, and if you try to speak out and convince somebody Who's, who is a Muslim to become a Muslim, to become a Christian, or if, if that, per, that Muslim changes his religion, both of you are subject to death. Does Ellen White say somewhere that God's hands will be on communication, that communication avenues will be maintained? And that's probably so that the satellite, the Twitters, and the internet can mm -hmm. educate I think I read that, that yeah. uh, God will I, I don't know where that is, but I hope it's true. I'll try to find <laughs> it. God will protect yeah. communication. Well, few of us would doubt, we as Christians, professed Christians, would doubt that God is going to somehow or other bring everything to a good end, finally, whenever that day happens. Okay? But do we want to be tested like Job before that happens? Ezekiel was told to be quiet about it when his wife died. Ezekiel 24, 15 and 19. Hosea was told to, to marry an adulterous wife, Hosea 1 and 2. And we already talked about Habakkuk, and we could go on and on. Think of the things that, I mean, Ezekiel was told to lie naked on one side for how many days, and then turn over and lie naked on the other side. I mean, you know, you know things were different in those days. I don't know what God would ask us to do, but... Are you bed swords back then? Well, he must have heard God pretty strong in order yeah. to do that. You know, one thing about today, and maybe uh, doctors you can uh, say, I think the population is u losing the ability to have patience through maybe our diet, pollution, air, whatever. I know as a school teacher, um, and I, I just substitute teach now, it seems like patience is a dying art. Yeah. And so maybe God has to end it because he can no longer deal with us because we've completely blown our mind and our nervous system. Yeah. Well, coming back to the latter rain, is there a way to know when it's starting? It's starting. Thank you. Well, how did you know that? In some countries it's certainly starting, it seems. I can remember we had a, a, a service right here in our university church about a year and a half ago now, I think it was, in which people came from around the world and talked a little bit about what was happening. And we had a parade of nations with all the flags and so forth, talked about what was happening. And one of the most remarkable things 
that was said there was for some people in India. They said for years India was very hard to work, very difficult to make any to convince anybody. They said right now the the church is just exploding in England. I mean, I'm sorry, in India, and um, one of those people said, if things continue going as they are now, very soon there will be as many Adventists in India as there are in the entire Adventist church in the whole world right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. The pure Adventist message is so potent and so uh, wonderful, mm -hmm. and we're running short of time. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do we know that the latter rain is starting? Each one of us needs to do our part to prepare. We need to be doing our Bible study, our praying, our witnessing. We need to practice giving good answers, acceptable answers, appealing answers to our neighbors, practicing with books like the ones you mentioned and so forth. Uh, we need to do this, and we need to do it. And when enough people are doing that, collectively and effectively, Jesus will be able to come back because there'll be their pe the people ready to stand firm and tall when the devil comes. Now, I don't think any of us are looking forward to the devil's activity, but we know it's coming. There's none of us that have any question about the fact that the de devil's persecution is coming. What's going to happen to us when this kind of persecution comes? I I'm sure the time is coming when we will be called before judges, what we say will be reported in the newspapers, etc., because people will be trying to pick our every argument apart. Do we have unassailable answers for what we believe? We'll be ostracized from public, so forth. And I read this final quotation from Ellen White. In the absence of persecution, they have drifted into, it, into our ranks, some who appear to be sound and their Christianity unquestionable. And then she goes on to say, when real persecution comes along, these people will fall out. And, and she ends up by saying, uh, when the law of God is made void, the church will be sifted by fiery trials and a larger proportion than we now anticipate will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Are we ready? Are we listening? Are we witnessing to the truth about God. Our kind and loving Father, may those who hear our message, really it's your message we hope, we hope we have represented you correctly, may they turn to you, may they seek ways to, to become more like you, may they learn a little bit from what we have said and from their own study is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.